Good morning. I'd like to present a talk on ENSO precursors and tropical Pacific decadal variability. This is joint work with PhD student Ying Ying Zhao and myself, Emanuele Di Lorenzo, that was presented at the GU 2017. First, I'd like to begin by characterizing what I mean by tropical decadal variability and define a sort of TPDV index. And I do that by taking the eight-year low-pass sea surface temperatures and computing the first principal component of the SST anomalies uh, between 5 south and 5 north, which is essentially in the tropics. And this is what the principal component looks like from 1955 to present. Now, if we take this first principal component and we just do a correlation map with the low-frequency SST, we recover this kind of uh, correlation uh, shape pattern that looks a lot like the ENSO-like decadal variability. And in fact, this type of ENSO-like pattern is one that is recovered if we look at the low-frequency uh, spatial structures of climate modes, such as the interdecadal Pacific Oscillation, or IPO, or the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, and so forth. So this is a recurrent pattern of decadal variability uh, in the Pacific. And if we actually square the correlation to find out how much variance is explained by this pattern, we find that at some locations, like in the tropics, it explains uh, upward of 80% of the variance. But you can also see that on the whole basin, it explains a lot of variance. So with that said, the question that I'd like to address today is what drives the ENSO-like decadal variance? And the goal of this presentation is to show that the largest fraction of the tropical Pacific decadal variability is energized by ENSO precursors from both the South and North Pacific. So what are these ENSO precursors? So let me give you an example. So this is a spatial pattern of anomaly in the sea level pressure uh, in the winter in JFM, January, February, March. And when you have patterns of anomalies like this, um, often you have a weakening of the trade winds, like in this case, this is a North Pacific oscillation pattern. This weakening of the off equatorial trade winds essentially reduces uh, the evaporation. And by reduction of the evaporation, uh, you have a warming of the SSC in this location. Now, once you warm the SSD, the warming of the SSD further reduces the winds, and the reduction of the winds feedbacks back into further reduction of the evaporation, creating a positive feedback. In fact, this particular feedback is known as the wind evaporation SSD feedback, uh, which is discussed in papers by uh, Shang Ping Si, and is often referred as the West. Now, once you have these SST anomalies in these subtropical regions, what happens is that the rotation of the planet makes it such that these anomaly propagates uh, towards the equator on a meridional plane, and as such, they have been referred to as meridional modes. And this uh, propagation uh, typically happens in the, in, the, in the spring, and there's a lot of papers by Weimund and uh, that, that document in Chang also that document these uh, type of modes. Now, the important thing is that these SST anomalies reach the equator. And when they reach the equator, an SST anomaly at the equator can actually favor or trigger an anent, an El Nino condition. And so, in fact, this is a well known that these meridional modes actually trigger uh, sometimes an El Nino response in the tropics. And once you have an El Nino response in the tropics, of course, you rearrange tropical convection. You have a shift in the convection cell, typically with high anomalous pressure uh, on the west side and low on the east side. And these anomalous pressure in the atmosphere generate Rossby waves in the atmosphere known as the Enso teleconnection patterns, which bring the signal back into the extra tropics. And this is an example of the El Nino teleconnections. And these anomalies in the, in the atmosphere generate also anomalies in the SST, uh, the winter, the following winter. Uh, and this is a shape of SST anomalies that some of you may recognize as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation Pattern. So this uh, uh, chit-chat between the extratropics, the tropics to extratropics, associated with this ENSO precursor, in this case the meridional mode, is an important way of reddening, if you like, the ENSO spectra and adding more memory uh, to ENSO. So with that said, uh, let's uh, ask the question how to quantify uh, the ENSO precursor contribution to ENSO. And to do that, I'm going to look at seasonal data, and I'll begin by making an index of the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO, in the months of October, November, December. And I do that by just essentially taking the SST anomalies during that season in this box here in the tropics, and just computing the first EOF, which essentially captures ENSO. You can see some of the ENSO events, for example, over here. Now, once we have this uh, index, now we can do a nice exercise. Let's assume you have your North Pacific and South Pacific, and we can take this index in October, November, December, and make a correlation uh, with the sea level pressures that are in the January, February, March that, you know, preceding the end. So, so these are essentially the correlation maps in the leading 
uh, January, February, March period, both for the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. And when you do that, you recover essentially the atmospheric anomalies associated with these precursors in the North Pacific and in the South Pacific. And in both cases, you see a weakening essentially of the trade winds in this region here and here. Now, in the previous example, I talked about how anomalies like these can generate meridional modes, but the reality is that uh, these kind of weakening of the trade winds are associated with a whole bunch of different type of ENSO precursor dynamics, which include, for example, the trade wind-induced charging, which is associated with the subtropical cell. This is work by Anderson, or the more canonical uh, historical one of the off-equatorial Rossby waves uh, that can be excited by these patterns in the wind, and this is work by Knudsen and others, and Manabi. So with that said, uh, what we can do is we can actually make indices of the spatial pattern of the precursors, which are shown here for the JFM, January, February, March. And, and here we have essentially uh, quantified the seasonal variability of these precursors, both in the north and in the south. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that if we correlate these two precursor indices, we find that there is uh, essentially zero correlation among them, and this has been uh, shown in two papers also by Ding et al. in 2015 and 2017. And this uh, gives us further confidence that these precursors of ENSO are essentially independent of ENSO. Uh, otherwise, if, it, if there was an ENSO component, they would actually share some correlation. So that's very good and gives us more confidence, in fact, that these are independent kind of energizer of the ENSO variants in the tropics. So with that said, we can go back to our diagram here. And what we're going to do now is we're going to try to reconstruct the ENSO time series with these two precursors by essentially super baking a very simple linear model where we say that the ENSO reconstruction is just equal to the north precursors plus the, the southern precursor index. And in this case, they're just weighted equally. So it's 50% this and 50% uh, the south. And if you do that, you can see that you reconstruct a, a good amount of variance. The correlation is 0.6. Uh, so that's pretty good. So we know that these precursors essentially contribute to the variance of ENSO uh, on different time scales, which I haven't quantified yet. Uh, but the important other aspect of this is once you have ENSO energized in the tropics, ENSO, of course, has its teleconnection back to the extra tropics. Uh, and, and so this essentially, uh, if you think of this, what happens is that you start with a precursor, say in the winter, JFM, you have the precursor affecting over the, the course of the summer, ENSO, ENSO grows and then peaks in fall and projects back onto the extra tropics the following winter. So this kind of loop is really an integration loop where you have internal stochastic variability in the atmosphere, both in the north and the south, that gets integrated in this loop. And this integration, I call it the reddening of the ENSO precursor, because essentially you add a long memory to these precursors by this integration that takes about a year or so. So with that said, the hypothesis that uh, we'd like to verify is that the seasonal variability in the strength of, of the extratropical precursor is reddened uh, by ENSO and its teleconnection to actually the decadal variance of the basin. So to show that, then, you know, um, uh, the one thing that we could start looking at is the oceanic expression of these precursor, and this is very revealing. So we can take those precursor indices in the north and south and make a correlation with the SSC in, in the January, February, March period, and this is what we find in the correlation pattern. And here the scale of the correlation is between 0.5 and minus 0.5, the red being positive. And um, what's interesting, you see that these two patterns are not similar at all. In, in the north, you get this kind of horseshoe pattern, which has been, uh, you know, discussed in the literature uh, originally by Penland et, al., uh, Penland et al. as the optimal perturbation pattern of El Nino. And in the south, you get this triple structure, uh, which is a uh, known also and precursor from the south, maybe discussed, I think, in Zhang et al. Uh, 2014. Now, the interesting part is we can now take these precursor indices, both the north and the south, and make a correlation map with the SSC of the following winter. And if we do that, this is the patterns that we get. And what's interesting is that you start from the patterns that are not uh, you know, uh, symmetric, if you like, with respect to the equator, different. And then through this loop process, of course, ENSO will kind of symmetrize, if you like, or make it symmetric with the equator, and you get this ENSO-like pattern for both of the precursors as they progress through this loop. So the, if you think of, for example, this uh, precursor in the south, during this loop, this uh, variance that is in the southern hemisphere, the, the precursors gets projected back also into the northern hemisphere. So you have these transfers of variance between hemispheres. And this reddening is essentially uh, what we'd like to show is, is the mechanism to actually redden and create low-frequency variance in the basin. Uh, 
So what we would like to show is that it is this reddening that essentially explains the bulk of the tropical decadal variability. So the question then becomes how to quantify the decadal vance explained by the precursors. Well, if we think about it, uh, we have defined an index uh, of the two precursors that contribute to ENSO just as the sum of the northern precursor index plus the south precursor index, which is plotted over here. So the idea is that this uh, kind of uh, uh, the, the, the low frequency content of these precursors is essentially the decadal variance, is the phasing of the decadal variance in the basin. So to, to extract that, we could just low pass this with an eight-year low pass, and this uh, we can refer to as the answer precursor decadal variability. So now we can ask the question, how much of the low frequency content of these seasonal precursors okay, is explaining uh, the tropical Pacific decadal variability, which we had previously identified as the first principal component of the eight-year low-pass sea surface temperature in the tropics. So we can correlate uh, this to the PC1, and we find that the correlation is quite high with a very uh, good alignment of the phase, uh, with the correlation is 0.8, which is about 65% about of the advance, so it's quite high. Now we can go a step further and we can actually quantify also uh, uh, the amount of spatial low frequency bands that are explained by each index in the, in the SST anomalies. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take, for example, the TPDV index and make a correlation square uh, with the low frequency SST anomalies, which is shown here, to extract the explained low frequency bands associated with this TPDV. And this is what it looks like, you know, we recover the ENSO-like pattern. And we can do the same for the ENSO precursor decadal variability, which is shown here. And if we look at the difference between these two, the TPDV minus the EPDV, we find that essentially the, the precursor explained most of the variance. There's very little variance left. There's a little bit in the tropics, about of the order of 20%, or a little bit, maybe 20 to 30%. But the bulk of the tropical decadal variability that is spread in the basin is really connected to these Eastern Pacific, uh, these um, uh, ENSO precursors. So the result is, uh, if you quantify this, is that most of the tropical decadal variability in the basin, 70%, can be explained by the low frequency variability in the seasonal strength of the North and South Pacific precursors. And so going back to our diagram, uh, I think we have verified that these precursors are essentially an important mechanism to energize and redden, if you like, the ENSO-like decadal variability in the basin, in the Pacific basin. Now, this is not to say that there are other uh, sources of stochastic forcing that are important in energizing the low-frequency uh, variance of the basin. And in fact, we know that internal stochastic variability in the atmosphere in the north and southern hemisphere are important mechanisms to drive, for example, uh, the, you know, the, the oceanic variability. Uh, one case here would be the PDO, for example, and here is the south PDO. And we also know that in the equator itself, along the equator, there are other sources of stochastic forcing, for example, from the Wenderly, Wisterly westerly wind bursts and tropical Atlantic that can also energize ENSO. But the point that we're trying to make here is that most, most of the tropical decadal variability, at least the phasing of that, is really connected to this uh, loop associated with the ENSO precursors uh, in, from the north and from the south in about equal amounts. So this is all for, for today, and uh, we have a paper in submission, uh, Zhao and Di Lorenzo in 2017, Answer Precursors and Tropical Decadal Variability, and you can find more about uh, the schematic, the analysis, and also their connection to uh, other climate modes of the Pacific Basin, which I have not shown today. Thank you very much.